Okay, so um, I'm actually going to uh, question the notion of ontological commitment a little bit. And uh, I'm going to say that it's not as important as we perhaps thought it was. So I'm going to go over some uh, possible analyses of the notion of ontological commitments, um, Quine's notion briefly, uh, Ryo's notion, uh, and then I'm going to argue at the end that um, the relation of ontological commitment is a hyper-intentional uh, relation, and it should be cast out in terms of what we are rationally required to believe, so that's some connection to the talk yesterday, if you were attending that one, the last one, Mark's talk. Okay, so uh, the overview, so what does ontological commitment mean? Um, well, so uh, I hardly have to, to repeat this, but uh, for Quine, uh, it has to do with the, um, the values of the variables on the assumption that the theory or sentence is true. I'm going to focus mostly on uh, sentences rather than theories, but hopefully it could be applied to theories as well. Um, now, Quine um, actually makes uh, a mysterious remark in uh, a different article, not in uh, on what there is, but in uh, notes on the theory of reference, because he says, well, the notion of ontological commitment belongs to the theory of reference. So what does that mean? Well, here's one thing it could mean. Um, it could mean that uh, the notion or relation of ontological commitment is on a par with uh, the notion of reference. So when we say that n refers to n, maybe that's sort of similar to saying that sentence s commits us to f's. Um, and that would mean that it's an extensional relation, um, where we can define an extensional relation in terms of whether um, it's referentially transparent in both positions. So for instance, if I say, so in the world of Superman, if I say Superman refers to, to Superman, um, and then I, I substitute Clark Cat for Superman, I get Superman refers to Clark Cat, and that's fine because it's obviously referentially transparent. Um, now, if the ontological commitment relation is referentially transparent in both positions, then we should expect the same thing. Um, but that doesn't seem so intuitively, at least if you want our theory or notion of ontological commitment to apply to false sentences, then that uh, seems to be give us the wrong result because I take uh, Santa and Odin from the Thor mythology. Um, and they, um, so, so Odin, the name Odin, and um, the name Santa, they would refer to something like the empty set or maybe um, a place in a structure or something like that. Um, and so they would um, possibly uh, co-refer, right? So you should, if it's an extensional relation, you should be able to substitute one for the other. But normally, at least the way that, that Quine normally casts out ontological commitment, um, Santa is and Odin is would have different commitments, not the same commitments. Now, so, well, we might say, well, who cares about false sentences? Maybe we should just restrict our notion of ontological commitment to uh, the true sentences. So maybe we are wrong sometimes about our theories and, and actually quite often wrong about them, but ultimately it really should be applied to true sentences. Um, that's then a different um, proof, which is um, a variation on a proof that Parsons has offered, Terence Parsons, um, back in the, in the 60s, uh, which goes roughly like this. Um, so um, let's, let's begin with uh, the implication principle. Um, um, so the implication principle says that the commitments of a sentence uh, implications uh, are among the commitments of the sentence itself. Uh, which seems plausible, so if you take the sentence, uh, there are uh, red roses, then that commits us to red roses, but it also commits us to roses, right? So it doesn't just commit us to red roses, so that's a plausible principle. Um, supported by, especially supported by an extensional account of ontological commitment. 
Now, so here's um, uh, another uh, principle that's closely related to the implication principle, um, which has to do with the relationship between commitment and satisfaction. So uh, we are still assuming that the, the ontological commitment relation is extensional. Um, so the following principle is, is plausible, that the set of entities that satisfy the predicate F is a subset of the set of sentences or entities um, to which their F is committed. Um, it's very similar to the implication principle, except it's talking about satisfaction. So again, um, their red roses would commit us to roses in addition to red roses, basically. So, so it's very related, it's consistent with the implication principle. But now, um, for the second line, um, so for any sentence, um, there are Fs, which could be that there are dogs, or there are chairs, there are humans. Um, that, of course, entails a sentence of the form that there's something that's F or not F. And of course, the predicate um, um, F or not F, of course, is satisfied by, by anything. So. So, it's sat so the entities that satisfy it uh, is a universal set, the set of everything, um, the full universe. Um, but then, by our very first um, line here, um, so they are Fs or not Fs, uh, is committed to the universal set. Uh, we can infer that because only the universal set has the universal set as a subset. Um, and then, finally, by the implication principle, uh, we can then infer um, that there are Fs is also committed to the universal set, regardless of what F is. And so basically, if, if ontological commitment is an extensional relation, then even a sentence, a true sentence, seemingly true se sentence, there are chairs will be committed to the universal set. So, so that wouldn't work. We can't just restrict our notion of ontological commitment to two sentences and take it to be an extensional relation because we would still get counterintuitive um, consequences. Okay, so um, a more plausible suggestion for what ontological commitment means is that it's a kind of modal or intentional principle as opposed to an extensional uh, Relation and uh, so Ryo has a version of the following principle that necessarily if their F's is true, then their F's. Um, and that's supposed to be a kind of conceptual or meaning analysis of uh, there are F's commits us to F's. Um, so this is, this is a modal principle and um, I'm assuming that you could also have a truth maker principle that would be similar to this one, um, which would basically uh, look the same way except you would have the, the relation of making true. So necessarily, uh, if their Fs um, is made true, or has a truth maker, then their Fs. Um, I'm going to focus on the first one, but I think that what I'm going to say is going to uh, apply to the truth maker principle as well. Um, the problems with that principle are some obvious problems. So suppose that numbers do not exist, and necessarily so, or pick your favorite entity that uh, doesn't exist and necessarily so. Um, then consider when we plug in the sentence in, in this um, and the sense in, in the modal principle, uh, then we would get necessarily if two exists is true, then two exists. Oh, sounds very plausible. It's actually true though, since the antecedent is necessarily false. Um, the other one will work too, so that's the second one of the counterpossible indicatives, uh, so actually the uh, strict conditionals. Um, so necessarily if uh, two exists is true, then two does not exist. Well, the consequent doesn't matter uh, since the, the, these are vacuously true. Um, now the principle, the Ryo principle as opposed to the modal principle is supposed to go both ways, so you can go from left to right and you can also go back from right to to left, and so we can get from these two vacuously two uh, conditionals, we can get um, um, two exists committed to the number two, very plausible. Um, but we can also get from the second one that